Good morning. Welcome to worship, everyone who has gathered here in the pews, those who are joining us online, and an especially warm welcome to any visitors we have here today. Um, we don't make you stand up. You know who you are. You know that you are welcome. We are happy to have you here. Um, you are all welcome to fully participate in all aspects of the worship service. Before we begin the service, a brief update on Joel Blaylock. Um, Joel is transferring into Manor Care. Is that right, Pat? Yeah. Um, and um, he is doing relatively well, will be there for rehab, and so it's still a little bit in the air, but the scariest part of this hospitalization are uh, past, basically, yeah? And, um, hold on one second, I'm messing things up here. This is too loud. Okay, so, um, if you got these babies here in the mail and forgot them at home, the ushers have more. Yeah? Talk to them if you are in need and forgot them, but there will be a place later in the worship service. All this worship service is, on, is about our calling, our baptismal calling. And for that reason, we have our baptismal font up front here, and it will play a prominent role later in the worship service too. So let us begin. All that we are is a gift from God. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. All that we have is a gift from God. The world and all that is in it. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the word of God's hands. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For God founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Our help comes from the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. Let us therefore glorify God. And worship God's holy name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us rise, if you are able, and sing together. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Our first lesson comes from the first book of Chronicles, chapter 29. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. God, Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. I know my God that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Luke, the twelfth chapter. Glory Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying. For it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. What is Christian stewardship? Responses to this question fall into one of two categories. There are those who view Christian stewardship as religious fundraising. And then there are others who define it as cultivating gratitude and generosity. There are specific situations that call for fundraising in Christian congregations. 
capital campaigns, building campaigns, major urgent repair projects that exceed the congregation's regular budget, and so forth. In general, though, I am not fond of presenting stewardship as fundraising for several reasons. First, this approach has a very self-serving connotation and leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Second, this approach focuses on scarcity rather than abundance, on fear rather than gratitude, and on the needs of the organization to receive funds to pay their bills rather than on our needs to give. I, therefore, wholeheartedly fall into the camp that defines Christian stewardship as cultivating gratitude and generosity. And here's why. As a faith leader whose salary is paid by this congregation, the focus on gratitude, gratitude and generosity does not feel self-serving to me. Gratitude and generosity are important spiritual qualities. They apply to all aspects of our life, not only to this congregation. People who approach life from an attitude of gratitude and generosity tend to be grateful and generous in other aspects of their lives too, towards family members, neighbors, friends, strangers, community organizations, faith communities. To think that I may be able to help foster such a way of living makes me happy and gives meaning and purpose to what I do as a leader. I also believe that Christian stewardship has to do with more to do with our need to give, to sacrifice a portion of our possessions in service to God and our neighbors, then with God's needs or the need of the organization to receive. Let's now turn from defining stewardship to listening to Jesus. There are two topics that Jesus talked about more than about anything else the kingdom of heaven and money. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God is not a place that we can lo locate in time or space. Rather, according to Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is a way of living. It involves such things as loving and trusting God, watching out for those in need, living in joy and hope and practicing humility. The kingdom of heaven requires its citizens to part with the norms by which the world lives. The kingdom of heaven has its own very upside down norms. Norms that Jesus enumerates in his Beatitudes. In God's kingdom, the poor, the mourners, the justice seekers, the merciful, the pure in heart, and the peacemakers are blessed and rewarded. The values and norms of God's kingdom run contrary to the values and norms of the world, as Jesus made clear time and again in his parables. But Jesus also talked a lot, and I mean a lot, about money. Apparently, he did not get the memo that says one must never discuss money or religion or politics in polite company. <laughs> Take, for example, the camel that won't get through the eye of the needle, the rich man building big, bigger barns to house all of his treasure, the widow's might, the treasure hidden in the field, the pearl, no one being able to serve two masters, God and mammon. Parables about servants entrusted with investment funds. Laborers being paid a daily wage. 
the precious oil poured out, <coughs> wasted, over Jesus' feet, and so forth. The list is long, too long for a sermon. Some of Jesus' best-known sayings about money are these. A passage in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he encourages his followers to store up treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. And then also the response, Jesus' response to a rich young man who hoped to find out what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus declared that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Implying that their grieving over parting with their wealth prevents rich people from following Jesus. Asked by a man to intervene in an inheritance dispute, Jesus told the parable of the rich farmer who ordered his workers to tear down his barns and replace them with bigger ones, to hold, to store his surplus grain for years to come so that he could sit back and be merry. Jesus calls him a fool for storing treasures on earth rather than in heaven. Each one of these three passages, each in a different way, addresses the idea of storing up treasures in heaven. Each one addresses a different challenge to generous living. Worry, grief, and fear. Worry can separate us from our God and choke our generosity. Grief over parting with our wealth can separate us from God and from our neighbor. And fear, fear that we won't get what we deserve, that we won't have enough, prevents us from seeing that what, is, what it is that God has done and will do for us. If worries, grief, and fear can separate us from God and choke out our generosity, what then can help us to cultivate a grateful and generous outlook on life? That is where King David and his prayer come into the picture. That's the first lesson that Linda read. Our first lesson captures a scene from the preparations for the building of the temple in Jerusalem, the very first temple. David, King David, now an old man, had summoned the officials of all of the people of Israel to assemble in Jerusalem. The officers over the tribes, the commanders of the divisions in the service of the king, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds and the officials in charge of over all the property and livestock belonging to the king and his sons together with the palace officials and the nation's warriors. He sh first shares with them that he himself had hoped to build a glorious, protective, solid, solid home for God's Ark of the Covenant but that God had told him to refrain from building the temple because he had been a warrior all, of, all his life and has shed blood. Instead, his son and successor Solomon will be the one to build the temple based on the plans that David has drawn up and using the resources and materials that Davis, David has set aside for that purpose. David then calls upon the people to support his young and inexperienced son in this building campaign, to contribute laborers, and to donate further funds, all in support of their common goal to build a central place of worship for the people of Israel. The people responded generously. 
David then blesses their offerings and asks God to bless the building project and the lives of God's people. In the words that Linda read earlier on for us. The passage begins with poetic praise and with a reminder that all wealth and honor come from God. David eventually launches into a lengthy reminder that everything he and his people possess, including the resources they had just donated, have initially come from God and are now being returned to God. While the immediate context of David's words is that of building a religious sanctuary, his words apply to everything in life. All that we have, all that we do, our entire lives are on loan to us for a preciously short span of time. One moment we are here, the next moment we are gone. Nothing, nothing in life can change that. All of us, each in our own way, are but specks in the larger history of humanity, in the history of God's creation. Individually, we do not amount to much. Collectively, we have the potential to restore healing and wholeness and act as God's partners in mission. In Christian parlance, we call that our vocation. The word vocation comes from the Latin verb vocare, to call, and means the work a person is called to by God. But how do we know what we are called to do and what we're called to be? There are just so many different conflicting voices calling us to all kinds of work. How do we discern which is the voice of God rather than the voice of our culture and society or the voice of our self-interest? This is the point where I often turn to the late Presbyterian pastor, writer, and theologian, theologian Frederick Buechner. Buechner has provided us with a very helpful tool for discerning our vocation, our calling. He told us that the kind of work that God usually calls us to do is the kind of work, A, that we need to do most, and I need a slide for that. Um, <coughs> is that the first one? Okay. Um, and that the B, that the world most needs to be, to have done. If we gen generally, for instance, get a kick out of our work, we have presumably met requirement A. Let's move, move on. Um, but if our work is, for instance, writing TV deodorant commercials, <laughs> the chances are that we've missed requirement B, which is that the world needs to have done. On the other hand, if our work is being a doctor in a leper colony, um, we have probably met requirement B. But if most of the time we've been bored or depressed by it, the chances are we have not been, uh, not only passed by A, but probably aren't helping our patients either. Vocation, calling, is, according to Buechner, where the two, the work that we need to do and the, and the work that, we, um, that the world needs to be done, intersect. Buechner then faints, see that, that sliver in the middle. So, oh, back. Okay, so, a being what we need to do, what the world needs to be done, where the two intersect is our calling, our vocation. 
Buchner then famously quipped that the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. So that piece where they overlap. The place where the world's deep gladness and uh, the, where your own deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. What does all of this have to do with Christian stewardship? The gratitude and generosity. All of these are interrelated. If we see needs, and if we have what it takes to satisfy those needs, that's our calling. Let's go to the next one. If we have the necessary time to devote to a project that needs our time, that is our calling. If we have the necessary skills required to answer a certain need, that's our calling. If we have the financial means, however small they may be, to support God's work in the world, that's our calling. Sometimes the places and tasks that God calls us to are in the church. At other times, the places and tasks that God calls us to are in other areas of life. <laughs> what matters most is not where we choose to serve God, but the attitude with which we serve, an attitude of faith, gratitude, and generosity. Stewardship is our, about our calling as followers of Jesus. Stewardship is about what we do after we say, I believe. Stewardship is about all of life, about giving ourselves to God and about using all that God has entrusted to us in grateful and constructive ways. Stewardship is about trusting God and asking God to free us from unnecessary worry, grief, and fear. From those worries, grief, and fears that separate, separate us from both God and from our neighbor. Christian stewardship is about learning to live a life of faith, gratitude, generosity, mercy, joy, and hope. Christian stewardship is about learning to live with grateful hearts in generous hands. to say together the Apostles' Creed. Instead, we are expanding a little bit on this. And we are going to affirm our faith. Part of this ritual, of this liturgy, is the Apostles' Creed, but in slightly different form. So, favoritly, don't peek in your bulletin. You won't learn anything from it. Dear friends, on this day of focusing on our baptismal calling as followers of Jesus and 
let us give thanks for the gift of baptism and renew the promises made on the day we were baptized into Christ. Let us pray together. Merciful yes, God, God, we thank, thank you that you have made us strong by water and the word and us. You have called us to yourself, enlightened us with the gifts of your spirit, and nourished us in the community of the faith. Uphold us and all your servants in the gifts and promises of baptism, and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to the earth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. And when people are baptized, when people affirm their baptism, there are questions involved in the different ways they can be posed, but we are going to do all of this. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, the powers of the world, this world that rebel against God, and the ways of sin that draw you from God? If so, say, I renounce it. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died in his He descended the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You have made public profession of your faith? Do you intend to continue in the covenant that God made with you in holy baptism to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ, the word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. People of God, do you promise to support and pray for one another in your life in Christ? We do, and we ask God to follow and us. Let us pray, and this time you get to listen only. So, let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give us new birth, cleanse us from sin, and raise us to eternal life. Stir up in your people the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and, and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. And we're not quite there yet. I love this. As a reminder of your baptism, you get sprinkled. And I'm the one who gets to sprinkle you. Today we have not only one, but two assisting ministers. We 
please join us in the prayers of the community. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, you tell us not to be afraid of what the future holds. Not to worry about tomorrow, but you know how difficult we find it to heed your words. In reality, we worry about many things, our families, our friends, our circumstances, the state of our nation, and the safety of our children. We come before you this day with our many big and little worries, and with confidence we know we can lay them at your feet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring our big worries about health and happiness and security for ourselves and our loved ones. We bring big worries about the world we live in and its, and its future existence as we continue to fail to address so many ecological problems. We bring big worries about the way people in our world are treated as less than human, exploited, tortured, helpless, and abused. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also bring the little things that concern us, the worries which keep us awake at night, the worries which only you know. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, reach out to all those for whom the future brings fears and uncertainties. Assure them that you are with them even when that future seems dark and circumstances feel like they are sprawling out of control. Remind them that you are able to transform even the bleakest of situations. Bring your healing and wholeness. Today we pray for friends of our congregation, Russell, Russell Beek, Joel Blaylock, Monty Clauston, Diane Peterson's brother. <coughs> Brian Dunn, Joyce's nephew. Dean Hendricks. Kevin, a friend of Ernie and Debbie Leparini. Herb Linder. Sandy Moisson, friend of Suzanne Henderson. Betty Rockwell. Ron Sorensen. Tom Worth. Prayers for all the clients and employees of Sacramento Self Help Housing. Lord, in your mercy. God of hope, there are individuals in our community who are hurting. Some are suffering from physical ailments, some are suffering from the loss of loved ones, some are suffering from mental, spiritual, and emotional distress, some are having family problems. Some are lonely. Some are suffering from financial difficulties or job problems. We pray that you would accompany and comfort all those who suffer. Grant them healing. Grant them peace. Lord, in your mercy. In the midst of this hurting world, you have provided us with resources that we can use to alleviate the suffering around us and among us. We ask that you would guide us to use those resources to share your hope with those in need. Help us give food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, welcome to the stranger, clothes to the naked, and care to the sick and in prison, so that gifts you have provided, we may bring your joy to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we make our prayers in faith, for we know that your spirit is at work in our world, making all things new. We lift our prayers to Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 <laughs> Peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you.
time, I would invite everybody to come forward to the offering baskets with your commitment cards and covenant cards. And if you are in need of an usher to bring you cards, raise your hand and let them know. This is the covenant cards. Those are the things that you are pledging to do to show love of God and love of neighbor. This is the commitment cards, and that is your financial pledge. And by all means, if you prefer to have privacy, feel free to use the envelopes in the pew to put either of those cards when you bring them forward. So as we sing, we'll bring our cards forward. And not the regular offering yet. Not the regular offering yet. The regular offering will be received as you come forward for communion. Let us pray together and dedicate our offering and pledges to God. Gracious and loving God, giver of all that is good and true and beautiful and life giving, these cards represent our strength, they represent our lives, they represent our dreams. The pledges which we make on them are but tokens of the awesome gifts that we have received from you. We offer our pledges and thanksgiving for all we have received, for all we have been inspired to be, for all we are challenged to become in this place. May they be the first fruits of all we have had, and not what we have left over, so that we may live out as closely as possible how many you give to us. May we see them as our offering to you, sacred holy, yet earthy, filled with possibilities. May we hold this image in our hearts and minds, so that as we watch our offerings each week come to your table, we can see our very selves being part of this offering, living in sacrifices to you.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right. Our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying <coughs> has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene, and Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea, and all their creatures, and with angels, archangels, cherubim, and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, blessed it, and then gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and he gave thanks, and then gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the will wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And let us unite our hearts, our minds, our voices, and pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not now ready. Everyone gathered here in Christ's name is welcome to receive at this table for Christ is both the host and the gift that is being distributed. And we will start on this side. The ushers will guide you to the table. Should you be in need of gluten-free wafers, those are av available as well. And the clear cups in the center of the trays contain grape juice. So come for all is now ready.
eyes if you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. <laughs> now into the world inspired by the radiant love of God live generously with open hands loving one another as if your lives depended on it be good stewards of the gifts you have received so that God may be glorified in all that you say and do and may the abundant love of God surround you May the extravagant grace of Jesus Christ sustain you, and may the constant presence of the Holy Spirit inspire and encourage you in every good deed and word. Live this week praising the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a seat. So, do you remember the big space news of the week? The rocket that exploded? Yes. What was the word? What were the words they used to describe the event? It was a sudden, unexpected, whatever. Um, so in some way, they consider that explosion a success. All the many things that went wrong went wrong, but experts are learning from it and improving the next rocket will be better, will fail in a different way. <laughs> so we are doing the same here right now in worship. If you noticed, we have three techies back there and we are watching all the many things that can go wrong with our sound systems. Watching it implode, give a back feed, whatever but we're learning from it. Thank you for helping us come. Our sister congregation of Ascension has sent a few of their own to help us learn and explode better. <laughs> Thank you.
we'll get to those slides eventually. But um, so in terms of volunteers, there are those that really volunteer and that those that are that are voluntold. <laughs> and the latter ca category often it can be found. Yes, my husband too, but um, <laughs> But the latter category often can be found on stewardship committees. It is not the most popular committee in churches, and I don't know why. <laughs> because you can fill it with so much joy, so much passion and faith and hope, and that is exactly what Nancy has been doing. So. as a little thank you from, from me for not pestering me during the vacation. And, and a thank you from our Excellent. hens. <laughs> Excellent. A little thank you from our hens at home. Thank you for making this such a joy, joyful and growth experience. Yeah? And if anybody feels so inspired to join Nancy, because stewardship is not just a one week thing yeah? or a one month thing, it's a year around um, project. So talk to Nancy if you'd like to partner up with her. So, and speaking of partners, we have partners here with us today um, from Thrivent. And Thrivent use is, as you may remember, is the merger of different Lutheran, Lutheran aid, associa aid association for Lutherans, Lutheran Brotherhood, became Thrivent Financial for Lutherans, then Thrivent Financial, and now Thrivent. Um, Jacqueline, do you want to introduce who is with you there? Yes, good morning. It's a privilege to be here. I'm Jacqueline Ellen, we're Thrivent. We're looking forward to an excellent luncheon. And my colleague, Ann Hill, will Okay, so lunch. I hope you skip any kind of golf club outings and lunches and join us here for lunch. That would be really awesome. So let's, um, another thank you for a wonderful worship service last week, for sharing so much of your own journey and for being so inspired and seeing it as your calling now to provide data that at one point will help others. So thank you, Carl, for last Sunday already. And on coming Sunday after worship, Carl and the um, Waste to Wellness team will be up in the fellowship hall. For those who are, are not able to be there, I will record this um, video record the Carl's talk and edit it a little bit and later post it. So you can access it later too. It just won't be live streamed. So, but um, that's next week coming up with now a profile view of Carl's brain <laughs> and a slightly adjusted image, not so much about the being prodded, but about the insights he gathered, the light that started, the light bulbs that went on in your brain. So then um, there is also one of our partners is Lutheran Social Services in Northern California. They have on May 4th, an art show and a grand opening of their new office. So more, more information will be shared, but that is happening. Then on May 6th, two things both happening at Good Shepherd Church um, on Morse Avenue. First, at between one and three, a conference assembly. This is sort of a miniature version, very, very miniature version of a synod assembly. Um, what happens there are two things. First, nominations for the office of bishop are gathered and then handed over to the nominating committee. <coughs> the actual election is in September in Burlingame, but our conference will just turn together which names we want to forward. And then any other conference uh, business that may come up, um, Anybody who wants to be there 
is invited. Eat beforehand, eat lunch beforehand, come then, but also maybe stay for at four o'clock, Charbel Zgreip, who was here, has been preaching here once before, um, will be ordained. Um, he was seminarian up until this point, has been building up an outreach ministry to the um, Arab speaking and for, to the Afghan communities, to ministries, is working on a Arab language Christian radio station and will be ordained. So that's four o'clock, same place, um, same date, May 6th. And on the 7th, <laughs> it's a busy weekend. Uh, you all, or many of you will um, remember Pastor Jose Luis. He, will, he is coming back to California, or has come back as of April 1st. He is now the pastor at First Lutheran Church in Orland and will be installed at 4.30 on May 7th. And I hope that we'll get together at least one carpool since this was kind of his congregation while he served on the staff of the, uh, at the bishop's office. So, but um, mother daughter tea, May 13th, and I think that's some, oh, then I have a photo on my desk at home um, with you on it. And Naomi and myself, us being in some politician's office as part of the first ever Lutheran Lobby Day. And so this is yet another instance back in person, not online or anything, on um, Wednesday. What is this? Sittende May? How do you pronounce this? I can't speak Norwegian for the life of me. Sittende Mai. <laughs> Um, May 17th um, from 8.30 to 3.30 begins at St. John's with breakfast and training and so and divvying up into teams and um, it's a really good way to, to be the voice of faith at the Capitol. You're not alone, you're in teams of three or four people and there, is a specific, there are specific talking points, there are specific issues that uh, Lutheran Office of Public Policy has identified, and they will be speaking to those and share how they may impact you. So more information there. Then, I think this is now the last one. Um, Linda Halfman Game Day, May 21st. End of announcements. <laughs> okay, let's stand and sing together. Should we sing something else? Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Place, Spirit, place, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy.
stewardship year-round. Praise be to God.